series of, uh, I'll start again. A warm welcome to you all to the fifth in our series of Raya Talk webinars. Uh, firstly, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is John Bone. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer for Raya Group, and I will be your facilitator for today's session. Uh, so please use the Q&A tab on your Zoom application to ask any questions to our panel members. If your question's targeted at a specific panel member, please make this clear in your question. You can ask the questions at any time, uh, but what I'll be doing is I'll be going through an initial set of questions to our panel members and then asking the, uh, the Q&A at the end of the session. Okay, so talking of my panel, today I am joined by uh, four distinguished panel members who are here to discuss the challenging environment of space and how they are developing their responses to space situational awareness. So let me introduce the panel. Uh, so I will go uh, in random order here. So first of all, I have uh, Dr. Holger Krag. Uh, Holger is the head of ESA's space safety program. He joined ESA as an analyst in the space debris office at ESOC in 2006, establishing risk models and an operational collision avoidance system and contributed to the first studies uh, for, space for space surveillance, excuse me. After a few positions within the department, he took the position of head of the SSA department, uh, uh, SSA program in 2019 and prepared the evolution into the SSA program, which was established at the Space 19 Plus Ministerial in Seville. So I'm sure Holger will provide us uh, an important insight into ESA's SSA program. Uh, next, we have Mark Rawlings. Uh, Mark is the Director of Business Development for Government Services at Utilsat. Mark has worked at Utilsat since 1992 and represents Utilsat at the Space Data Association, the SDA. Uh, the SDA was founded by commercial satellite operators for the benefit of the satellite community. Uh, he was chairman between 2015 and 2017 and he will be providing an overview of the importance of SSA activities from a commercial operator's perspective. Uh, next, I have uh, Fred Pelletier. Uh, Fred is technical director in SSA at uh, North Star Earth and Space, based in Montreal. Uh, Fred has been at the forefront of space object tracking for over 20 years and as a lead navigator for missions to Saturn, Mars, Pluto and beyond. His expertise in image-based navigation recently helped deliver the NASA spacecraft New Horizons within Arakov, a 35-kilometer Kuiper Belt uh, object, the furthest ever explored body in the solar system. Uh, so Fred will provide a valuable insight into space domain awareness and space traffic management. And last, but by no means least, we have uh, Jim Cater. Jim is uh, our regional vice president for both uh, Germany and Italy, so that's for Rea. Uh, Jim rejoined Rea in February 2021, and in his career, he has worked for various spacecraft operations and consulting companies after gaining an engineering degree in the Royal Navy. He has extensive background in all aspects of space, spacecraft and ground operations engineering, so Jim will provide an overview of the importance of the security aspects with relation to SSA activities. So welcome panel. Uh, so for just, just as an introduction to Raya, so for those of you who are not familiar with Raya, we are a, a security and space engineering services company with over 650 employees across uh, Europe and Canada. So Raya's focus is to add value to our customers through the delivery of specific expertise, techniques and technologies. So today's webinar, we'll be discussing some of those, uh, some of the area of expertise that we provide to our clients that are protecting their space assets through effective space situational awareness. So um, firstly, I'd like to ask uh, Fred. Fred, so as a commercial provider of SSA services, could you tell us more about Northstar? and how it proposes to support operators in space domain awareness and also space traffic management. Uh, certainly, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to this uh, webinar. I'm, I'm very honored to be here. Um, so before I answer your question, let me describe a little bit uh, uh, a context to how I see it and, and how it, it ties into my background that you just described. Uh, so the, the world economy depends on satellites. Um, 
we, we all rely on satellites every day to support essential service. You can think of weather uh, navigation with GPS and, and, and uh, GLONASS or, or Galileo, uh, telecommunication and you name it. Uh, it. It's all important in our daily lives uh, for both business, individual, government, you name it. Uh, but keeping space sustainable is, is a must and it's, a, it's very much a global problem that, that we all have, have to address. Um, in, 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 20, uh, in, in February of this year, Adam Jonas, the head of the Morgan Stanley Research Space Team, uh, said that space is existential from the future of our planet to the future of commerce. Um, and I think this is why we, we are here today discussing this uh, incredible challenge. The Organization for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development <clears throat> concluded in 2020 that with, this, with the level of orbital density uh, that we have, according to mul multiple modeling efforts, and I, I'm sure that ESA, uh, Dr. Craig, contributed to this, uh, it's not a question if a defunct satellite will collide with the debris, but when. Uh, and let's, let's think about this for a second. Um, the funk satellite and debris, those two things are uncontrollable, uh, at least to, to today. Uh, so it's, 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 it's going to happen. Um, it, you, I'm sure everybody uh, who's listening and who's on this field remembered the infamous Cosmos Iridium collision in 2009 uh, that, that created a super big debris cloud. Uh, but more recently, we've witnessed uh, similar things. Uh, you can think of the ISS problems. In, in 2016, there was a, a chip on the a window of the European uh, cupola, I think it's called a, a unit. Uh, the Canada arm uh, was hit in 2021 by debris. Um, more recently in March, the Chinese satellites Yunhai was whacked by uh, rocket debris. Um, and uh, it was said that the, the prediction were about a kilometer, uh, that the, the two things would, would come to close to each other, which is, within the margin of error of current tracking system. So clearly that's, that's not enough, we must do better. Um, uh, let's talk about the, the challenge a little bit. Um, on, on space traffic management point of view, uh, there's an explosive growth of, of commercial space. Uh, in 2020 alone, uh, more than a thousand satellites were launched. That's more than four times uh, what we've been used to in the past decade. Uh, space debris are uh, measured in millions, if, uh, if not 100 millions, according to ESA and NASA studies on, on one millimeter size object. Uh, so it, I think it's fair to say that the growth in these activity has stretched the current uh, SSA framework, which is military led at the moment, to a breaking point. Uh, commerce and, and we have to do better. Uh, from a protect and defend mission, uh, it's, we're talking about 300 trillion kilometer cube to cover. Uh, and, and the military folks have worried about not only uh, space traffic management feature, but also on cooperative objects, uh, space cyber attacks and things like that. Um, so without a secure and a safe and space environment, the use of space today is at risk. Um, and and uh, now to go back to your, your, your question, uh, let, let me just give you another quote from a, a Washington think tank called the Center for Strategic International Studies. Uh, they, they concluded uh, in, 20, uh, in February of this year that space domain awareness, particularly from space-based system, stands out as particularly important because it is helpful across a wide variety of scenarios and it's a key enabler that makes any other type of space defense more effective. So this is where North Star comes in. Uh, we, we've uh, studied this problem. We've and we've reached the same conclusion and we've decided to, uh, to come up with a, um, a, a commercial offer to this problem to serve clients both uh, on private and government uh, to, to really facilitate the new space economy with timely, precise and verifiable data. But to do that, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're developing a constellation of satellites with optical uh, payload or telescopes that will uh, collect data uh, for space object tracking on a global scale all the time uh, from all orbit regime, from LEO all the way to cislunar, uh, nonstop essentially. Uh, this will be a contribution, our contribution to the, to the global problem. We're, we're not saying that we're gonna do this alone, absolutely not, we're, we're part of, the, of a global team that must do this. But uh, 
it, it's going to help us uh, fill a lot of gaps that we currently have. So just briefly on our product, uh, I spoke about the uh, at, at the beginning, we're doing space object tracking. That includes not only the, doing the detection and getting the data, but also uh, doing data transformation, data conditioning, curation, the orbit determination to determine catalogs, ensuring we maintain custody on objects. But on the product side, on the commercial side, we want to offer direct to client. And again, client is could be commercial, civil, or military, any any kind of of of, of these three. And and we want to offer a service that really speak to the, the immediate need of the customer. Conjunction warning is absolutely the, the best example, but there's also things like uh, flight plan validation for owner operator, uh, anomaly detection in space, proximity and rendezvous support, and that kind of thing. Um, allow me just for a sec to, uh, to tie this to my NASA background. Uh, you did mention I, I, I participated in the, the navigation of, of New Horizon to Arakoth. Uh, it, it's, it is a 35, 36 ish kilometer object. It was 6.6 .6 billion kilometer away. And I was in charge of navigating to that, to that object. Uh, it's, it's the equivalent of tracking a CubeSat in the geostationary orbit. And so all the knowledge that I've gained in my years of, of doing this, I'm, I'm applying this to SSA. I've been working on this project for the past uh, eight years. And, and the common LEDs are, 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 are really uh, phenomenal. So in short, uh, space sustainability requires a global international effort. Uh, it's not a single entity that will do this. Uh, we will contribute by having space-based system to deliver uh, services uh, starting in 2023. Uh, we'll, we'll have a uh, uh, always on system that provides early warning detection over denied territories, uh, our tracking our own all orbit regime and in between. That's it. Back to you, John. Thank you. Thanks, Fred. That's uh, a really good start. Really interesting. So, um, so over to you then, uh, Mark. So, having worked in the commercial sector for more than thirty years, uh, and uh, that space comes through the, the more the three C's: the congest, congested, contested, and competitive. How do you see commercial operators reacting to this environment? And, and also bearing in mind what Fred was saying about the, the collaboration and the global aspect of space situation awareness as well, with your uh, role within the SCA. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, John. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me along to this uh, talk. Um, so uh, as John mentioned, I, I work for UTELSAT and UTELSAT is a uh, global app, uh, satellite operator providing SATCOM satellite communication services and it's been doing this for more than 40 years. Um, so as a satellite operator, as a commercial operator uh, with uh, infrastructure in space, our objective is to protect our assets and our commercial business and make sure that it, it, it remains profitable. Um, the assets, uh, our satellites, uh, are, are merely the means to exploit the resources. And these resources are the orbit, um, the orbital position, um, and the uh, frequency rights. So the, it, the, the, ensuring the safety of that, that infrastructure is in, essential to us. Um, and how, we are, how we've seen um, the evolution of the space environment. So we've seen an acceleration in that change in, in recent years, uh, it's been fairly stable in the first, up, up until maybe 2015, we've seen a very stable sort of uh, environment, gradually gradually increasing in risk, but, um, uh, and difficulty to, to operate, but uh, nothing, nothing, nothing greatly changing. Um, We've gone from very, very few satellites, uh, uh, mainly in geo, uh, starting in, in the 60s and 70s. UTELSAT, uh, with its first satellites in the late 1970s, hand in hand with um, ESA, it was a very scientific sort of uh, operation. Um, moving today's, to today's environment, where we've got hundreds of satellites in GEO and thousands in LEO, and uh, a space environment which is much more consumer-orientated and very uh, much more accessible with cheaper launches and smaller satellites, and it becomes a very sort of easy domain to access. The frequency domain, the management of the interferences, um, 
and uh, these, these bands are limited and, and they're shared. Um, and previously this had been um, something that uh, was, was managed on a, on a fairly sort of friendly, informal basis. And, uh, and moving to the physical domain, um, the, the work that needs to be done to ensure the safety against uh, other spacecraft or, uh, or, or against debris. So we've seen, uh, as John mentioned, uh, 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 Frederick mentioned, sorry, a very large increase in the number of objects, the, the objects that maybe can't be tracked. Um, and uh, each of those represents a, a, a risk to, uh, to, to our satellites. Um, on top of this, uh, in more recent years, um, the out outer space is now becoming a battle space uh, where we're seeing intentional jamming on frequencies um, uh, and not even a battle space in the sense of military, but um, uh, commercial. So, to, so the, 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 the challenges to, to, to frequency rights and the rights to use um, the, the, the limited RF, RF bands which, upon which our businesses are, are based. So, uh, <clears throat> and then we have a more um, hard, the harder, harder uh, military side sorts of threats which go beyond accidental collisions and debris threats um, and, and threats that may be um, uh, against, uh, against spacecraft. And then again, cyber threats to our assets in, uh, in space. So what are we what are we doing as um, commercial satellite operators um, to to ensure that things are, our systems remain safe and operational? So voluntary coordination. I've mentioned this previously. So the Space Data Association, which was created in two thousand and nine by commercial satellite operators, and includes around thirty different uh, contributors at the moment, including NAP, entities such as NASA and and um, and national sovereign satellite systems. Um, it counted around 600 spacecraft uh, when I was last involved uh, in the Space Data Association in 2017. Um, and it's got an operational system. So we, uh, all, so all, the, all the contributing members um, input their uh, orbits. Um, we've got access to the uh, US space catalog as well. Um, and we also put up below our, where, what, we're, what we're going to be doing. So um, uh, future maneuvers. So we coordinate to, to ensure that we don't um, crash into one another. And, and if there's a potential for a, for a collision that we get warnings um, and we can take uh, evasive action, either coordinating with somebody who's got, else who's got an active satellite or um, if it's a piece of debris that's coming our way to, to take uh, avoiding um, maneuvers. Um, second point would be to uh, we invest in sy other systems to protect the asset, asset. So we've got more capable satellites such as um, the Utilsat Quantum, which has recently been uh, launched and will be shortly op operational, which is in bringing into the commercial world um, some of the features of military satellites so and a certain ability to uh, do uh, uh, identify um, interference and uh, take evas evasive actions and um, more capable ground systems as well. So having a diversity on the ground system to be able to redistribute um, uh, services. Um, the monit enhanced monitoring and control systems to be able to detect, identify and resolve uh, RF interference, um, radio frequency problems, including interference, so geolocation systems on the ground. Um, and then from the cybersecurity side, making sure that uh, our networks are ultimately protected, particularly the TT and C ones where we've got encryption on the satellite links um, and uh, uh, our ground-based TT and C networks completely isolated from other networks and extremely high levels of protection on our, um, on our corporate and operational networks. Mm -hmm. So where do I see the uh, see 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 the work uh, going on and um, uh, in in the rules and regulations? I think this is a critical area of where we need to see um, um, uh, activity uh, working with government. So as as a Utelsat, as a as a as an organisation in in France, in Europe, but with a big footprint around the world works with multiple governments to um, to ensure that uh, uh, we remain um, uh, 
we remain in coordination with them and also with the UN agencies such as the ITU, of course, UNIDIR and COPQELPS, uh, the International Telecommunications Union, the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research, and the Committee on the uh, Peaceful Uses of Outer, Outer Space. Um, and then best practices for running spacecraft. So making sure you deorbit or deactivate graveyarding, 24 year rule, the 24 year rule for, for deorbiting spacecraft for LEO uh, satellites and making sure that um, uh, the uh, environment remains uh, as, as a clean and as, pos as clean as possible. And that as an individual satellite operator, we, we do the maximum to ensure that that, uh, that happens. Um, and uh, a final point on that is the, the willingness, people, uh, new operators in, in particular, to having a win ability and willingness to uh, protect assets and the environment and to ensure that there's an understanding of what happens if the environment um, um, uh, is, is becomes a more difficult place to operate in. And we can do better that. Um, for the future, um, it's going to be, uh, a, 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 we are going to be in a situation where uh, the pressure is rising on, um, on, fre on frequencies, uh, they're a limited resource, um, it has to be very clear who has the right to what and where they can, can operate, um, uh, better governments, um, and, that, and the, the potential to have ac actions against bad actors or people who don't follow the, uh, the, the rules. Um, and protection of ass assets from, against attack. As a, as, a, as a commercial satellite operator, one of the worst things that we could expect would be um, something uh, happening to one of, our, one of our spacecraft. So having a, uh, something, a, 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 a means of monitoring what is happening in the space environment. And I believe that we must do better in, in, in this domain. Thank you very much, John. Okay, thanks, thanks, Mark. That's a re really interesting points and valuable points you've made there. Um, so for, for Holger, um, Dr. Holger Craig, so with ESA's position really as, a, as the European leader in, in uh, space technology and development, and also the, your, your position as a global player in spacecraft operations, um, how has ESA responded to this challenge and how do you see the ESA uh, program, the space safety and, and, and particularly the SSA program developing over time? Yeah, thank you, John, and um, also thank you for for actually inviting me to this to this panel. That's that's a lot of fun. I, I enjoy talking about the space safety program. Um, we actually see two challenges. One is a natural one, and the other one is a man-made one. The natural one um, is the space weather, so everything that is caused by the sun in interaction with the with the Earth's magnetic field. Um, this is, as we know, is inducing currents, is generating plasma, is changing the magnetic environment of assets in space. And uh, as a space operator with, with 20 spacecraft that we are flying here in Darmstadt, we, we, we see single event upsets, we see other space weather induced events. So this is, this is something we are, we are living with. Um, and of course, there's nothing we can do to stop it. Um, so what can we do in a program? Um, we can provide at least early warnings. Like a pilot gets in a plane, um, first thing he does is check the weather forecast. A satellite operator before in doing critical operations, an astronaut before, in, before entering um, you know, an, into um, extra vehicle activities or landing on the moon will check the space weather forecast. The space weather forecast doesn't exist today. Uh, we are not able today to provide any sort of reliable forecast. This is what we want to change. It takes 15 hours for a coronal mass ejection from the sun to arrive at Earth. We need to be we need to be able to provide a warning a few hours before that. So that requires to go into deep space and observe the sun and provide uh, information in real time. This is what we want to do with the Lagrange uh, space weather mission. Now let's come to the man-made problem, which which my the previous speakers have already introduced in an excellent way. Um, likewise here with the 20 spacecraft that we fly, of course we experience what it means to, to be uh, in an environment which is at risk. Um, there's an avoidance, a collision avoidance uh, maneuver necessary every two weeks. Uh, there are hundreds of alerts 
coming in in a day. Um, of course, we cannot tackle all of them. We have to filter them, and we filter them by probability. And uh, um, uh, Frederick has explained it quite nicely. Here, the accuracy matters. The more accurate the data is, the less false alerts we will see. The more pleasant it will be for the operator. Uh, we are dreaming of a world where we get only really the alerts that are relevant for us. Uh, and that means we probably only have to maneuver once or twice in a mission, a mission lifetime. Um, but that means that the surveillance data must get much, much more accurate. Um, we, are, we are looking at technology that could be useful in order to achieve that. That's definitely radar with higher frequency. That's also laser. Lasers have made an amazing progress uh, in the past. You're getting now echoes back also from non-cooperative targets, so even debris that has no mirrors on board. And we believe it's actually also a niche for commercial um, for commercial applications. The two previous speakers have said it. Um, if the accuracy or the response time is better than what is provided by, by uh, you know, let's say it, uh, the, the baseline systems, the public systems that are around, then uh, there's a niche and there's a, there's a customer that is prob uh, probably attracted by it and also willing to pay for it. We believe this, we, this is what we must um, help to develop. Uh, we need this in Europe more. You see many of these um, endeavors in the US. We would like to see them in, in, in Europe as well. We would like to explore how we can help them. Uh, and we will therefore introduce a so-called competitiveness element in our program that will look at uh, proposals coming in from industry um, that we can support over the last mile um, as an anchor customer to get over the hill um, and get actually fully implemented and uh, uh, you know grab a base uh, in, in in Europe so that we can help that that market to develop here as well. Uh, we believe that also coordination between operators will be required. Um, it used to be the previous speakers explained it after the Iridium Cosmos event, our number of collision avoidance maneuvers doubled because many of our spacecraft are exactly flying in that altitude. That's, it was already a lot of work before, now it's even more. So we need automation here. We need better data, this, this we had already. But now we have an increased amount of space traffic. And suddenly, every second avoidance maneuver that we have to do is to avoid another living spacecraft and not anymore a fragment. And that, that brings an extra complication because you would need to coordinate action. Now, pilots are used to that. That's uh, they're in place since decades. In space flight, we don't have that at all. There are some people that said, but we need flight rules first. But I think we need the technology first because very often it's through standards uh, that um, prove to be practical and that are actually used. <laughs> um, and then regulation follows. Think of the think of the conjunction data message that's commonly accepted space traffic management standard today. I think for the coordination, we need uh, something else. We need something similar. And I think we can have a bottom-up approach and we can have industrial, even even uh, even yeah, technical approaches, open source approaches, even um, uh, looking at this kind of coordination effort. Now, last topic what I, that I want to open is, of course, we may not contribute to that problem ourselves. Uh, unfortunately, you know, mitigation measures are in place since 20 years. That's a good thing. You find them in many space laws. But when you look at how well they are actually applied, and that's quite transparent to see because you cannot hide your behavior in space. It's very transparent what you do. Um, only half of the missions actually manage to implement these measures at, at the end of life. And public missions are not better than private missions. And uh, U.S. missions are not better than Chinese missions. It's it's a, it's a common problem. It's a common problem, and it's not bad intent. I'm quite convinced it's very often lack of reliability of the system to do a complex disposal maneuver, to do passivation action um, at, with a mission that is 10 years old, um, and uh, then very likely to fail before we can actually do it, even if the mission is designed to do it. So we need we need not only regulation, we also need technology to overcome it. Deorbiting kits, ways to implement passivation autonomously, even when the power bus is not 
uh, even the, when the spacecraft is not fully functional anymore. Um, this is what we need, and we need active removal. And then people are asking, but do you want to remove everything uh, with actively with, with clear space? No, of course, that's not the idea. But if we can show that active removal can be done, regulators may pick this as an as another option in their regulation to make use of. And uh, I think that will create very, very important incentives to get better at disposal. Where do we where do we move? I said it, competitiveness elements, mitigation technology, higher accuracy in tracking, and the last thing is in orbit servicing. When when we manage the step to a rendezvous dock and uh, remove an object, the next logical step is to rendezvous dock and manipulate an object. For example, to repair it, to refuel it, to reposition it, or one day even to recycle it. So this is something we foresee. And again, we would like to go with an approach similar to Clear Space One, the first removal mission that we are going to fly in, in five years. We are also looking for an industry-led proposal together with the client, not a demonstration. We want to go, we want to see a servicing action from Europe as we have seen it in the US lately. We want to see that as well with the real client satellite. And uh, this is what is something that we are going to propose for the next Ministry of Council as in my view, next logical step after, after the active removal mission. So thank you uh, very much, John and colleagues. I hope I was not not too long with my statement. <laughs> well, that was that was uh, very informative and uh, yeah, really interesting. We'll come back to some of those points, I'm sure later. In fact, you've had a couple of uh, questions. Well, one question already. So, um, final member of the panelist, um, Jim. We've uh, we've focused a lot lot on um, debris and, and and other space borne assets, but also I think Mark mentioned it in his. Um, his talk as well, the the, the threat of, of cyber. So um, cyber introduces another dimension of vulnerabilities. Can you tell us a little bit more about how operators are responding to that particular threat? Sure, thanks very much, John. And it's a pleasure to be participating in this, this panel today. Uh, a very timely um, example of what a service outage uh, chaos can cause if you just Think back to yesterday with Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, all down. Even though it was not a cyber attack, it does show the importance of service continuity and the effects of those sorts of uh, disruptions that, that can happen. And obviously nowadays, space systems, space data, space positioning and timing data and satellite communications are growing in importance every year. Uh, we've witnessed a huge growth in satellite launches uh, I think it was uh, Mark who was saying that uh, we've been launching over more than a thousand satellites every year. In the 10 years up to 2018, that was only 2,300. So you can see the extrapolation on, uh, on the launches. Now this growth has been fueled by both an increasing dependence on space applications and a dynamically changing environment exemplified by the new space era, you know, but which are backed by extensive private investment. You know, some of the mega constellations that are, are being put up at the moment, you know, OneWeb, Telesat, SpaceX, and others, they're going to be more and more over the coming years. Now, as part of this, there's a drive, this is driving space to be cheaper, faster, and simpler. However, the downside of that is they can be more vulnerable unless it's thought about in the implementation process. End-to-end -end space systems deployment and the adoption of the ground segment as a service are both enabling greater access to space. Uh, the increased profile and influence of space systems is also making them more of a target uh, for cyber criminals. You know, the space products and services themselves are highly vulnerable, uh, valuable, uh, incorporating state-of-the-art processes and uh, significant intellectual property. So they're becoming much more valuable uh, assets to, to be attacked. Uh, they also, becoming a target because they provide the foundation for services and applications, you know, encompassing telecommunications, remote sensing, navigation, and all of these things are relied on, not just by uh, the citizens of the world today, but also governments and defense organizations. You know, at the same time, today's focus is on end user applications, which often combine space and ground data. These applications rely heavily on IT ground components and networks and cloud infrastructures. 
such IT features, as well as the shift to the ground as a service type approach that we're seeing, uh, is increasing exposure of space systems to attack. You know, Mark was saying you know, their, their systems are completely isolated uh, from, from the external world. However, there are, you know, from the ground segment as a service world, they're easily uh, connected to the rest of the internet. So uh, it's becoming a much more uh, opportunistic uh, environment in which cyber criminals can work. And obviously it's not just the flying satellites, it's the spacecraft and the design and development environments can be, are still a potential target. If you can, if you can plant malware before the satellite goes up, then you've simplified your, your role, as well as obviously attacking those ground space communication links. Uh, they're completely visible to everyone. And as Mark was saying, everything is uh, highly encrypted nowadays. But leading on from that to exactly from the space assets to the vital services provided by SSA. Uh, I mean, we've mentioned the Iridium Cosmos collision um, uh, several times in, the, in these presentations. Well, actually, a, a fragment of that collision uh, was imperiled the Sentinel-1B mission last week. Uh, the approach was calculated at less than 60 meters between debris and spacecraft. Uh, so they obviously had to do uh, an avoidance maneuver. Perhaps this might have been one of the first examples of the proof of the Kessler effect. But what if the, that flight team had not received the data or if it had been spoofed? Uh, if that satellite had been taken out, that would have been 50% of the mission capability and capacity removed. The revisit rate for the mission would double. You know, it would be a severe degradation of the Sentinel-1 mission. Similar for space weather. You know, even in 2012, the UK government considered space weather as a potential disruptor for the Olympic Games. Uh, so, it is showing that it's vitally important that SSS data is precise, verifiable, and timely. And to this end, you know, both ESA and the EU are acutely aware of this increasing vulnerability and are taking a proactive approach. From ESA's perspective, as we heard, space is contested, congested, and competitive. And therefore, there are more actors wanting to disrupt uh, those, those capabilities. So, but even if the target is a third party, then the space systems uh, around it can still be exposed to collateral damage. So meanwhile, the EU at the European Space Conference uh, earlier this year in January also expressed concerns that space-based solutions are weakened by insufficient defense against cyber threats. Uh, and security was a central theme, theme of that conference. So, ESA and the EU are getting together to support their international stakeholders through their security framework regulations and directives and through a joint security agreement. On ESA's behalf, they are targeting a holistic and coordinated approach to security, which practically means at the moment they have an existing cyber range, which they are evolving to become the security cyber center of excellence. Now this center of excellence will provide cyber awareness and training to improve organizations overall cyber security posture and also strengthen what is always known as the weakest link, the human factor. It has space uh, security validation facilities that can emulate the environment within which a uh, space, space program will operate and allow the testing of those cyber attacks against those systems to ensure that organization security procedures uh, are fit for purpose. They, they are implementing a security test and vulner vulnerability assessment facility, which will ensure the effectiveness of space ground systems uh, by executing test campaigns, so vulnerability assessments, penetration testing, forensic and risk analysis. And finally, they're also implementing a security threat and information sharing platform which is going to be a collaborative platform to, to exchange information about security topics, cybersecurity topics between interested parties. And on top of all this, ESA is also implementing its own cyber and security operations center, which although built for ESA's use, will be extended for support to uh, the space industry and the wider European industry as required. So as you can see, there's a lot of activity going on at the moment uh, to 
proactively uh, prevent these uh, cyber issues arising and supporting them when they do arise. So hopefully I, that uh, yeah, that's my talk for now and back to uh, back to John for the question session. Yeah, that was uh, that was great. Thanks, Jim. Some uh, some valuable insights as well. Then. So uh, we've we've already got a few questions coming in, but please uh, uh, use the Q and A button on your panel on your Zoom application and and ask anything uh, any questions that you want to post to the panel. So I'll start with uh, this one from David. Uh, let's see. So um, how is the space insurance community reacting to SSA initiatives? Uh, could it be a source of complementary funding to the global SSA management? Since it will defi definitely mitigate the, or the in orbit risks by preventing collision, could it be a way for satellite operators dec to decrease their in orbit their in orbit insurance premium, if any? So um, I guess I'll, I'll pose that one initially to, to Mark, being a, a commercial operator. Is this something that uh, you feel that the space insurance community is is focused on? Uh, so there's two, 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 two snippets of information, I suppose, here. Um, uh, one from my past in the Space Data Association, when we did um, have some discussions with the insurance industry, and their position actually was completely opposite to, to, to that. Uh, it, they would be satellite operators decreasing their in-orbit in pre insurance premium. Instead, they were looking for if they didn't cooperate, they'd increase the um, premium, which is perfectly acceptable from uh, understandable sort of response from their perspective. Um, the second is something that's come uh, it, that's been in the public press re release recently about um, insurance for Leos and that the, 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 the short term perspective, short term the next three or four years. Um, I recall reading that um, the insurance community was questioning whether they will be would be willing to insure satellites in Leo orbits in in coming years. So um, uh, it, these are the, the, that that particular bit is um, is a public information, and uh, I've got no sort of particular comment on it. So I hope that answers um, your question. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Mark. Anybody else like to comment on that, Fred? Particularly anything that not yeah, can, uh, right from a from a commercial perspective, uh, we are in discussion with insurance providers, and the answer to the question, uh, the short answer is yes, they are a source of, of, of extra funding uh, that that we're looking for. But the, I would say that uh, it's perhaps not mature enough that uh, we're we're not there yet. So it, it ties into also. Uh, the regulator aspects that um, I, I forgot who, who who talked about this, but um, uh, the world of regulation has to to mature a little bit to to help uh, drive this this business this market. Um, but we're definitely in the discussion with them, and it's absolutely okay. uh, a source. Okay, thanks, thanks, Fred. Uh, Holger, any comment on that one, particularly from an ESA uh, perspective? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, my colleagues certainly a bit more closer to this, but um, mm. I have seen cases. I have seen cases where, where um, the collision avoidance efforts done by a company are, are used to negotiate uh, the insurance uh, the insurance fees uh, with the company. And I also know that, you know, how to how to ensure a mission doing in orbit servicing or active removal uh, with potential risk of of performing mm. damages. But here the experience is uh, insurances are reacting positively to that. So the companies are offering to uh, to cover also this. You, you can basically insure everything. That's my experience. You can <laughs> you can get an offer. You can get an offer for for everything. Now the what they are, what they definitely immediately see, and I must say many of them are well prepared and have have already their risk databases covering. Uh, these aspects that they're also using um, risk mitigate risk assessment tools that uh, that are coming out of the science community. So this is developing, but it's focusing still on the self protection. So if you do something to protect yourself, um, that's that's definitely counted. But to protect the environment, um, I think here we, we we as one of the previous speakers said, that still has to develop and, and mature a bit. And, and th thanks, Holger. And, and not wishing to exclude, exclude you, Jim. And 
I guess uh, there's a lot of insurance companies now focused on cyber attacks. So um, as Holger mentioned, these um, threat risk assessment tools are being used in, in that environment and now being used in the space environment, I, I, I understand. Oh, absolutely. I mean, as you say, it's uh, insurers are not just looking at uh, insuring, well, basically they're, they're insuring the, the loss of an asset. So, and that can come from, from multiple causes. I mean, my thought on this was sort of yeah, likening it to car insurance. You know, do you just take out the third party insurance to, to insure yourself against damaging someone else? Or do you get the fully comprehensive policy, which uh, ensures you as well for the loss of your service? Because it's more important, much more getting more and more important that satellites are seen as providing a service. And it's, it's whether that service is it, continuous or not, that, that comes into you know, what is insurable. So, yeah, thank you, Jim. Um, one directly to uh, Dr. Craig: Does ESA run its own conjunction analysis on its satellites? Yes, we run our own conjunction analysis, um, but of course, we depend on data coming from elsewhere. We don't have our own data source. We mm -hmm. are receiving the data from the. 18 space con control squadrons, so from the US surveillance system and the EU SST. And uh, these two are combined and, and processed by our own system. Um, yes, that's that's a, yeah. a brief the answer, but it doesn't mean that we are not helping other efforts uh, in, in running private conjunction services. So there's already quite a good um, ecosystem of, of companies around us um, um, that providing their solutions that also calibrate their solutions with ours, mm -hmm. uh, which, which gives us some sort of certificate that uh, that their service works as well as ours does, uh, which which helps a lot in selling this uh, this to customers. So this this is absolutely our role and this is what we do. But of course, for the safety of our satellites, we need to rely on uh, on our own uh, on our own analysis. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank, thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Craig. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll move to the next question now from Roberto. For any SST systems being developed, is there interest in creating so-called digital twins, mm -hmm. schemas and knowledge models for them and associated data? Uh, there's an example there. Um, and uh, Roberto offers to, to contribute as it's one of the focus areas. Now, I'll, I'll ask this one initially to, um, to Jim, perhaps, based on uh, some of the uh, messages you gave uh, regarding the, uh, the the cyber range and, and exact, effectively the, the digital twin emulation of a, a mission control system or, a, sorry, an end-to-end -end space mission, in fact. So um, could you uh, contribute to that, Roberto? Oh, abs absolutely. I mean, the, the work we're doing with ESA on, on that uh, space emulation system, you know, it is working out the what is a useful granularity of emulating the space systems? How 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 much how close to a real system it can be? How mm -hmm. configurable to the to obviously the multiple types of missions that are out there: single satellites, mega constellations, etc. So, you know, replicating that through digital twins that can be used both to uh, test uh, security procedures, also uh, attempt those. Uh, attacks and assessments to ensure that uh, the system is, it, in and of itself is robust and can deliver the services effectively. So absolutely, yeah. there is a lot of work being done in this area. And, and Fred, what's what's North Star's view of this? I, I guess there's some, obviously some level of modeling that you need to do to uh, represent the space environment from, uh, as projected by the, the, the sensors that you have on your satellites. Yeah, I, I'm struggling a little bit with uh, making sure I follow the, this digital twin uh, schema. Uh, if we're talking about uh, a system that co-locates data from many sources and, and curates it, then it's definitely something we do. But are we talking about uh, duplicating things or for re resiliency and redundancy, perhaps? Yes, sir, I'm, I'm no expert, but my my interpretation of a digital twin is a is a emulated representation of the real world sort of. Oh, okay, uh, okay. Of, 
of that. So it's it's uh, you know like a modeling environment where you can place real data and and uh, and emulated and simulated data and and. Okay, thanks for clarifying. That that's absolutely at the core. Of <laughs> as I said, no experts. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it makes sense. Modeling and simulation, as I said, is at the core of, of what we do. Mm. Uh, not only because we have to design our constellation to meet our requirements for object tracking, we have to make sure that it's uh, it's going to give us what we expect. So modeling and simulation is is there to, to design the system, but also from a data processing and product marketing, uh, not marketing, product uh, development perspective, uh, this is also very key in, in making sure we can model space environment, uh, including all uh, potential uh, perturbations, I would say, to to uh, what's happening out there. Uh, as, a, as a navigator in space for, for more than 20 years, I'm well aware that modeling uh, in perfect world situation is, is not what, what really happens. So you have you have a, you need a system that, that uh, will take care of the non gravitational forces that that may act on on an, uh, an object in space, for example. What does that mean for the data that you get? It may not be exactly as precise as you thought or as, as clear. Uh, you may not detect it. Uh, you may have difficulty fusing it with other data source or, or, or making sense of it. Though. So that's definitely at the core of, of uh, what we do at Northstar. And I think it's key in the business we're in. We're discussing this with several uh, colleagues and partners at Northstar and in it, it's uh, again back to my original comment. This is this is how we going to solve this problem, uh, and not in a silo, but at globally. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Fred. Uh, so I think uh, a question for um, I'll give this one to Mark to start with. As a satellite operator, do you combine data coming from primary flight dynamics and data from sensors uh, in order to? To perform your collision avoidance maneuver, so, uh, so UTILSAT as a satellite operator obviously um, uh, tracks its own uh, spacecraft, um, but we uh, rely on um, uh, the Space Data Center, the uh, Space Data Association system uh, for uh, for conjunction um, uh, analysis. Um, we also uh, work with uh, at least three governments for um, for coordination of, um, of of any sort of maneuver um, activities, particularly this sort of thing. So if we've got a um, a, a, a collision, a, a conjunction uh, forecast, then we will, depending on the type of the object, we will. Um, we're, we will we will coordinate this uh, this this with the, these entities. So we don't we don't it, it's um, it's not normally uh, something that we would do uh, unilaterally. Okay. And and uh, the question same question to uh, Dr. Craig. Um, Olga is, is, is do you combine this information? You, obviously, you have your own flight dynamics um, yes. personnel with an ESOC. Yes, that we do that. We we compare our own uh, two-way ranging solution to the to the one we are getting from uh, US space surveillance and we use the best combination of the two um, indeed and we also share we also share our maneuver plans with the um, US surveillance system and with the world uh, in as an as a first uh, contribution to uh, to space traffic management data sharing is the beginning of um, of space traffic management uh, in my view and if you allow me one word on the digital twin um, I wanted to raise your attention to um, ESA's digital twin initiatives that are coming up with the next ministry. You probably heard of the digital twin Earth, mm -hmm. and that will come to, that will now be come together with the digital twin universe, which is doing okay. exactly what was said before. Um, the space environment um, will be represented in there, um, including space weather effects and data. Um, debris environment um, aspects and data, and of course also um, everything you need to know in terms of um, conjunction analysis, for example, depending on the covariance accuracy of data. You, we would like to fold that in a digital twin universe um, as, a, as a large modeling um, exercise uh, in a separate program even. So uh, stay, stay tuned for that. Yes. 
Very interesting. So digital twins are going to play a, a big role then within ESA, I think. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Fred Frederick, uh, anything to anything to add on the the comments by um, Mark and Holger so far on the the combination of data, with telescopes and geo satellite tracking? I guess also um, the way North Star are going to be working it's from space based um, surveillance as well. Um, yeah, um, we actually are developing our our commercial offer not just based on Scott Art, but on fusing data with other other sources and, and and again we don't want to work in a silo with this so we we're hoping to work with all of you uh, on, on this but it we on we make it a, a key uh success criteria to do that because it's very important to cross check yourselves with other systems um mm -hmm. and and on, honestly even though uh, we don't have our scott arc system today uh, and even though we all acknowledge that we we have we need more data, uh, there's a lot we more we can do with what we we have today uh, in terms of curating the data. And and I can think of of a few examples. If if uh, if Mark has flight plan uh, data that he's uh, utilizing the uh, Space Data Association to, to to understand what conjunction he may have, well that's that's a little bit in a black box somewhere. And then you got 18 at SPCS doing tracking uh, on its own. And then the US, USST does it too. All of this should come together to squeeze more juice, if you allow me the expression, out of, the, out of what we got today to really bring truly space domain awareness. Um, to, to, uh, just to, to add to, to what uh, Frederick said, uh, UTOLSAT also uh, uh, shares with the um, 18th Space Command and uh, we all, uh, the Space Data Center also exchanges with um, with, uh, with, uh, with the with the with the with uh, the 18th Space Command as well. So um, the all 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 the data is going around, um, and uh, there's quite a lot of corrective action that happens when when this data is shared because it picks up um, errors. So you see uh, differences uh, of uh, orbits. Uh, between these two when you compare two separate databases and so we what we're finding is you, you, you it becomes a beneficial sort of environment where um the data uh, becomes better because you're sharing it yeah thanks, thanks Matt. in fact uh, I appreciate that because you've also answered another question so um uh, uh, Dr Craig anything else to comment about how ESA interacts with 18 Space Command no, indeed, indeed, we, we share uh, maneuver plans and uh, our up to up to date orbit determination results, but not the two way ranging data, as we as mm -hmm. I see here in the question. I think that that is that that is going too far because uh, uh, you know uh, you would need to know many things about the station to uh, to make sense out of that data. So we 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 are we are limiting it to the orbit determination results. Okay, thank you. And uh, so we've got a couple of minutes for mm -hmm. one last question. And it's uh, a difficult one, so I'll probably send this one straight over to, to Jim. Uh, how, <laughs> how quickly does the panel see quantum secure networks being built? Will there be a capability gap between quantum computers being powerful enough to crack current security methods and new security coming online? So Jim, do you want to start with that one and I'll pass that around the, the panel. I, I may well question. bounce that because I heard Mark talking about uh, his is brand new quantum satellite. So, but uh, from the capability gap, I think uh, once we get quantum up and running, it'll be a while before before it gets cracked. So, uh, so just to clarify on one <laughs> little point, <laughs> the uh, the UTELSAT quantum satellite is a software defined satellite and does not have anything to do with quantum secure networks. So, um, oh, uh, it's uh, sound like <laughs> Um, but uh, things like uh, quantum key distribution um, and, and uh, encryption is, uh, is, is something that we are uh, or probably all looking at, actually, um, mm. and uh, how we can uh, leverage the technology to protect and increase the security of our systems. When it when it when it becomes available, we'll have to see how we, uh, we, we how we can adopt it and integrate it into our um, into our security networks. 
Thank, thanks, Mark. Unfortunately, we've uh, we've run out of time. But Holger and Fred, have you got something quick to say on quantum? We don't use it. Um, we don't use it for space safety. We believe we must. We want to give away the data, right? It's, it needs yeah. to be shared. Uh, but of course, we don't want the data to be intrigued or uh, our system be stopped from providing data uh, because people rely on it. Cybersecurity is therefore an issue for us, but quantum uh, uh, secure networks not so much. And all I would say on my side is that security, uh, being a commercial business, is very important for us. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, panel. Thank you for a very interesting and thought-provoking uh, conversation. Uh, I appreciate your time. So uh, again, well, thank you very much for joining me today. And, uh, and thank you for everybody who's uh, listened in on this. Um, there will be uh, more rare talks coming up. And uh, if you need any more information on future rare talks or on rare, uh, www.rayagroup.com. And I hope you enjoyed today's session and look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Thanks very Thanks much, everyone. Thank you. Hmm? Take care. Ciao.